more than that. The thing about history that's important for you to know is that people, often polit politicians, leaders, parents, people in positions of authority will use the term history, la historia, history, to have weight, to have authority. But history is not the same thing as the past. That's the first thing I want you to remember today. The past is something that happened. History is something else. So why do you think I say that? What do you think the distinction is between history and the past? Anybody? Come on, sir. Meaning, think of it. Because history is constructed. And by whom is it constructed? By the people doing the selecting and the interpreting. Where are you? Who said that? Bravo, for wherever you are. A plus for today's class. <laughs> Bravo! Come on, join me. So, the past is here. History is over here. And in between we have people, subjects, with interests, the power to select, the power to organize, the power to decide what gets told and what doesn't get told. And why that matters is because in the process, certain interests are served, certain people benefit, and other people don't. Other people are disfranchised or disempowered through that. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Where most people encounter their history, professor, see, is, is in heritage spaces, right? So I want to also make a distinction between history and heritage today. Heritage, well, we'll talk about history first. It's the study of the past, how something comes to be. We look at how people make choices, how individuals use their agency to affect change. It tends to be a discipline of the head. We look at evidence from a broad range of sources, and we vet them, means we weigh them for their accuracy and their precision. We're very interested in multiple perspectives, right, when we write history, to try to weigh what is the most accurate and precise version. We like ambiguity, and we love argument, right? Historians love to argue, we love a good argument. And if it's an argument, it means there's no one single truth, right? There is no truth. If it's the truth, there's no argument. Everyone agrees, right? So it's about being critical, whereas heritage, on the other hand, is about this set of inherited traditions of beliefs that you just know in your heart and in your gut to be true. It is often how something just is, it feels natural, it feels normal, it feels true to you, even if the evidence doesn't necessarily support it. Often it's around treasured objects, historic sites, artifacts, and there are group values attached, and this is where it becomes about politics and power. When one group decides, this is the story of Mexico. Ooh, right? That's a fight thing to happen. There are a lot of stories in Mexico, right? That if one group decides they can control that narrative, that's when you have heritage at work. So it's largely gut, largely heart, and it's largely narrative versus argumentative. So we're going to talk about these today, looking at some examples of moments in the public sphere, in public history, exhibits, the landscape, monuments, where this attempt to tell a single story is complicated, right? The attempt to have heritage mean one thing for all people is challenged. So, when I say memory war, the name of my talk, what do I mean? I'm really not as interested in the wars themselves. Today I'm talking about World War II and the American War in Vietnam. Did anyone notice what I just said? Yes. How did I describe the American War in Vietnam? How do you normally hear that phrase in North America? Well, yeah, see, it's got that. But how is it usually as a phrase? In the United States, we call it the Vietnam War. I said the American War in Vietnam. Rhetorically, that's a very different thing. Vietnam, to Amer North Americans in the U.S., is the war. Whereas, in fact, Vietnam is a country and a people and a whole long history, right? So even the way that you choose to use your words. For example, when I talk about enslavement, I don't say the word slave owner or slave holder. Those are domesticated, gentle terms. I use the verb enslaver. These are people making choices to enslave other people. I also never use the word slave. I say enslaved person, because first and foremost, an enslaved person is a person. And if you reduce them to just their adjective of enslavement, you reduce their humanity. And that's a political move through words. And that's a dangerous thing in terms of citizenship and democracy and power. So, we're not going to talk about the wars themselves. We're going to talk about what I like to call the messy, imaginative aftermath that is the cultural echoes of these two wars in the landscape. So I'm going to have to move quickly here, so run with me. We're going to be in the U.S., we're going to head over to 
to Vietnam for a while. We're going to go over to some other country. So, where do we find these places? We find it in public facing sites, like historic sites, museums, popular films, documentaries. And this is where most people get their history again. Hold on to that idea. So, why does it matter? It matters because this is about fundamentally power. Who controls representations of the past? Right? Power. Second idea is what stories get told and how do they get told? Who don't? It's about citizenship. And finally, it's about justice and democracy. Where I teach, I teach in a Jesuit school. Uh, we very seriously take the notion of social justice as central to our curriculum. So it's always about justice. So let's get into it. First idea, symbols are not neutral. Symbols are not neutral. Symbols have all sorts of meaning for the people who elevate those symbols to have power in the, in the culture. This is an example of a painting from the 1850s in the United States of an event that took place after the reading of the Declaration of Independence in New York in 1776. After the reading of the Declaration of Independence, a group of people, of colonists, pulled down a statue of George III. This is this great revolutionary moment. What's interesting is that that statue then became to stand in for the tyranny of the British monarchy and the Americans' colonial experience, but also that this painting is done, is made, right before the American Civil War, is regurgitating that symbol, this notion of, of tyranny, right, of, of power, the power of the state to impose um, rules around enslavement, or the power of one group of states to secede from the American Union. Symbols are not neutral. This might be familiar to many of you from the war in Iraq, right? One of the first things that was in American media was this image of the U.S. Marines pulling down a massive statue of Saddam Hussein. Interestingly, in much of the media, the U.S. Marines doing the polling were edited out of the image so that it seems as if just naturally by the presence of U.S. forces, this regime is toppled. When in fact, it's not passive voice. The Marines are pulling this down. Another way that picture was edited uh, was with many Iraqis in the foreground, um, as if it were the Iraqi people themselves pulling down the statue. Not that some of them weren't pleased with it, but the ways in which those visuals, kind of like what Sam talked about earlier today, the image that Cameron wants to capture is also an act of power. I am delighted to talk about, if any of you are interested, the problem currently in the United States around Confederate culture, the culture of the Southern Confederate states and these statues that litter the landscape um, that represent a certain vision of the South, a certain vision of white supremacy, and a certain vision of enslavement around which we're having a lot of debate. I'm not sure you're aware of that going on at all. It's a very big question, and it's a question around representation that's also relevant in this context. This is also a post-colonial society, right? And it's interesting to see in my three days here